we are so grateful to have you all here with us today. Um, I'm Elisa Jansen Jones, and I'm here with uh, Scott Edgar and the wonderful Matthew Arau as well. And we want to provide you with some great options for caring for yourselves and your students and, and driving that connection. I know teaching online can feel impersonal sometimes. And we want to give you these core ideas so that you can create a look and feel and, and the, the wonderful connection that you should have with your students that drives really authentic music learning online. So this is a little bit about, about who we are and you're going to learn more as we go on. So if you already know who we are, uh, just be patient while we get through this part really quickly. So like I said, I'm Elisa and I'm the uh, producer of the Music Ed Mentor podcast and the Music Ed Mentor blog. I do lots of online workshops through that platform as well. I'm the founder and CEO of the International Music Education Summit, which is a professional development conference that's always been online. We've been doing it for years. Uh, I'm a columnist for SBO Magazine. I've written a couple of books and I'm currently pursuing my doctorate in instructional design. And then Dr. Matthew Rao is gonna wave at you. Uh, he's a professor of music education at Lawrence University. And you guys can probably introduce yourselves, but I'm, I'm on a roll, so I'm just gonna go with it. And he's a con Silmer clinician and American Band College faculty. And he has a, a wonderful YouTube channel, Upbeat Global and a corresponding Facebook page and, and uh, a couple different Facebook groups as well. So a wonderful way to come together and really talk about mindset and, and all the wonderful things that Matthew teaches. And then Dr. Scott Edgar is an associate professor of music and music education, chair of music education, director of bands. We're all band directors. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Although I've, I've spent a lot of time in elementary as well. And uh, he's the author of a fantastic book, Music Education and Social Emotional Learning. And if you want to hear more from him, I recommend you get to my podcast because I had him on my podcast. When was that? Back in November, I think. November is when we recorded it, but it yep. came out in December, I think, right before Christmas. So Perfect. check out the, the podcast. And uh, we're just so thrilled to be with you today and be able to share these these tips with you. So. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Scott. All right. So, you know, I, I've been doing a few of these uh, webinars, but mainly dealing with social and emotional learning and what that looks like. And today we're going to talk much less about what are these activities and what are these skills that we need to do to engage our students and just the humanity of it, just the humanity of how we used to be able to look into our students' eyes and know how they were feeling. And, and we've lost that largely, even through a webcam, we don't get that same effect. I want to start by just normalizing that this is not normal. This is far from normal. This is far from anything that anyone has ever experienced, uh, let alone tried to teach through it, let alone try to learn through it. This is not normal. We are all engaged right now in severe trauma. We are tra traumatized by this. You know, one of the big buzzwords that uh, we have in education is trauma-informed instruction. Well, folks, there is no such thing as trauma-informed instruction and non-trauma-informed instruction now. It is just instruction, and it is all trauma-informed. So however we are enacting with our students, it needs to be trauma-informed. That's why the, the things that Matthew and Elisa and I are going to talk about today are so important. Now, I'm also going to suggest that pre-pandemic, that things weren't as good in education as they could be. Things weren't as good in our lives as they could be. And if we come out on the other side of this, the exact same way that we went into it, we haven't done our job. Nothing should go back to normal. Normal wasn't working. If we go back to the way things were, we will have lost the lesson. May we rise up and do better. We can do this. You know, we're going to get through this and we are going to be stronger because of it. I cannot wait to see my students again. You know, I had the privilege of Skyping in. I'm on sabbatical this year, but I had the privilege of Skyping into one of my colleagues' classes and just seeing my familiar faces on the other side. It did my heart good, and I can't wait to see them in person. It's going to be such a powerful moment the next time that I'm able to drop a baton and hear the great music that we can collaboratively make together. 
Folks, I'm a high school and middle school band director at heart. You know, the kids came to me before school. They came to me in the middle of school for lunch. They came to me after school. It was all about music was a safe space for many of my students. Now, acknowledge not all, but for many of my students, they wanted to be a part of music. And this was the space that they came for security. That has been ripped away from us. That has been ripped away from our students. There is absolutely no security that we can provide them remotely in the same way that we used to do in person. You know, this picture is also proof that I used to have hair. Lisa said she did elementary. I think that, you know, if I had to do it again, I might still have a little bit of hair on my head. Uh, but that being said, when we think about what our students mean to us and what we mean to our students, we need to come up with strategies of how to care and how to be compassionate for our students remotely. So when we think about what this means in terms of instruction, prior to the pandemic, so much attention was to upper level. How do we get our students up Bloom's hierarchy? How do we get them to think critically? How do we get them to that elite level of musicianship? And you know what this did, the pandemic did? It just put a magnifying glass over the importance of basic human needs. And we can't get to that level of musicianship, of that buy-in, of having all second graders on the floor together with a common purpose or mission until we account for our students' basic human needs. Right now, so many basic human needs aren't being met, and we are realizing that we cannot get to instruction or anything like that until those needs are being met. So let's talk a little bit about care. When we look at what care looks like, traditionally, we think of it just as that top layer there. So it is a carer, typically an adult, caring for a student, whether that be a child, whether that be a kid, whether that be a neighbor's kid, one way arrow. But when we look at the potential for care, there are so many other layers that we can explore. How can our students care for us? Well, how do we teach someone to be a compassionate carer if they can't practice? Can we give them opportunities to say, here is a need that I have. What can you do to provide service and fill that need? Beyond that double-sided arrow, can we provide opportunities? Can we set up a structure for students to care for each other? And then, you know, as we're learning now throughout all of these great webinars that are being produced and all of these opportunities to join each other in collaboration and solidarity, teachers are able to provide care and compassion for each other. You know, so often in music, we find ourselves locked into our back caves. We find ourselves isolated in the corner of the building. And oftentimes we're content with that. We're happy with that level of isolation. Unfortunately, that doesn't provide us an opportunity to often provide care and compassion for each other. And I think this experience of going through what we are now is highlighting that. So oftentimes, we make assumptions about what our kids need. We make assumptions about what our students need. We make assumptions about what our spouses need, our significant others need, what our friends need. You know, that's not the best way about it. To be a proper carer and to meet the needs of a cared for, we need to ask. We need to understand that the students can have a voice in saying, you know what, I understand that you're trying to help, but you're really not you're making an assumption about what I need, and you really don't have a clue. We need to have the humility of saying, you know, I'm not the fixer in this position. I need to ask you, what can I do to help? What do you need from me? I know what we had when we were together. How can I replicate that in the most authentic way possible? And the only way you can do that is to ask your kids. We need to be empathetic. The only way that we can do this is to prioritize the other. Empathy is the number one word that I would want to hammer home uh, for my perspective on what this looks like for care. It needs to be about the needs of the other. And the needs of whoever we're caring for is going to dictate our care. It's going to dictate our compassion. We can't walk blindly into a situation and say, I'm going to do this for you because it's the right. No, maybe one day it was previously, but now it needs to be driven by empathy. It needs to be driven by where our students, where our significant others, where our friends need us to go. And the only way that we can do that is to honor each other's voice and choice. Oftentimes in education, we fall victim 
to it being only the voice of the teacher, only the objectives of the teacher, only the activities that the teacher is laying out for students. Well, now is a great time for us to put a pause button on that and saying, you know what? The students have a voice and the students should have a choice. And that's what's gonna dictate our ability to have a dialogue as opposed to what can look as a very one-way arrow between the teacher to the student. One of the most powerful ways that we can help our students uh, and can care for our students is to teach them how to be resilient. Now there's other places that I'm talking about skills and activities to build resilience. But for right now, all I'm gonna talk about is we all need help picking each other up. There are days that I pick myself up well and there are days that I don't pick myself up well and that I need help. We need to be there and be aware of when people are down and when they need help being picked up. And then we have that question of saying, what do you need to be uh, to help me pick you up? So that we're acknowledging. Uh, and sometimes, oftentimes, it is nothing more than an empathetic ear. It starts and ends with listening. Oftentimes, as teachers, we try to fix things. We can't fix people now. We cannot fix people. We could never fix people, but sometimes we tried. Now we just need to provide an empathetic ear and say, you know, what do you need? Well, sometimes I just need space to talk. So here are some questions that might get that ball rolling, might get that ball rolling to start to honor some voice and choice. What do the arts mean to you? You know, what does music mean to you? What do you miss so much about that experience? If we're going to meet the needs of the students and realize that they're mourning the loss of that music classroom, well, can we have that discussion? We need to understand what they're missing. Ask them, what are the benefits of having freedom to work independently? Let's show a little bit of a silver lining here. There are benefits for students driving that train. How are you dealing with the disappointment of canceling concerts, performance, that trip? Oh my goodness, our hearts are breaking because so many of these activities are canceled. Let's ask our students, how are they dealing with that? How are you utilizing an increased amount of time in our day? Oh my goodness, you know, um, our students have so much time to self-design their, their schedule. Well, sometimes they're going to need a little bit of help to make sure that that time is being used effectively. And maybe just asking them how that's going is a step in the right direction. What is one area of music that they can improve on before they return? If we're really developing independence and we wanna care for them as an individual voice within our program, well, let's give them the autonomy to work on something that they've always wanted to work on. They may need some guidance to figure out what that is. And then how are you doing um, to maintain, what are you doing to maintain healthy social relationships? We all need help with that. Another way is to get our students, to care for our students, is to be able to help them express how they're feeling. So understanding, you know, I may not have the words to really delve into how I'm feeling right now. Well, let me help you with some options. Emojis are a great way to do that, to get our students to say, you know, I don't know what I am, but I like how that picture kind of looks. That's kind of where I am right now. And if they don't have the words, maybe they can draw a picture. Just utilizing a little bit of an emoji backdrop to our discussions can really help our students reflect you know, as we're engaging in remote learning, I would love to see in the comments so many things start to pop up that are accompanied by emojis. I think that's a critical way for us to start to engage our students. We're all anxious right now, folks. Let's just face it. We're all facing a certain level of anxiety. And, you know, I usually use this slide to talk about performance anxiety when we take the stage and we get nervous. Well, right now, we're facing another type of anxiety. You know, I get anxious when I go to the grocery store. I don't like doing it anymore. I used to love going to the grocery store, not anymore. But what can I do to prepare myself to be better prepared and make myself less anxious? The more prepared I am, the less anxious I'm going to be. So what can I do to take control in a situation that I have so very little control? The more prepared we are, and if we can frame that for our students, I think that's going to help them navigate a lot of the anxiety that they're feeling, a critical way that we can care for them. You know, I've had the privilege of working with some high school students this year, and this these are the words of those students. You know, they are absolutely longing for the family that they've lost. I'll give you a second to kind of scan this while I read just the bottom one. I'll miss having my second family. They were the people I went to when things were rough at home, and now I have nowhere to go, yet they're still reaching out to me. That level of care that we have been providing and that we still can provide. 
you know, we live in a product-based music education world. You know, we prepare for programs, we prepare for concerts. We thrive on applause, we thrive on standing ovations, we thrive on all of that. Unfortunately, that's been ripped aside. Even if we have a virtual uh, choir, a virtual band, a virtual performance, we're not hearing that live validation of what we've done and our successes. We need to celebrate our students. That's how we need to care. You know, whatever level that we saw ourselves as a carer for our students before, it needs to be ramped up. We need to celebrate our students and we need to be validating them as artists, as musicians, and as people. So we're gonna pass things over to Matthew now, who's gonna to continue to explore this idea of connection. All right, welcome everybody. It's an honor to be here alongside with Scott Edgar and Elisa and, and all of you. And uh, before giving this webinar, I just had the, the privilege of leading my music education students in an online class. And uh, I just found such a joy and connection of, of getting to, to see everybody and uh, check in with everyone. And I certainly noticed that I spent a lot more time on the front end of the class uh, just going around the virtual room and uh, having each student share something about themselves. It was our first class together with everybody. It's the upper level students merging with the first year students. And then we used a function on Zoom called Whiteboard. And I said, hey, what what's something that you're grateful for, brings you joy, or you find comfort in? What's something that's helping you cope? And we just filled up that whiteboard. And uh, there are just so many words. And it was just a great almost chaotic but loving way to express ourselves. And I found it took about 15 minutes uh, at least at the front end of class for what we would call social emotional learning check-in. And uh, that was much more than I might've done before. And I, so I completely agree with Scott that things have shifted and students' feelings and emotions and how they're doing ha definitely trumps everything else. And it's shifted the way I think about content, uh, how I think about grading or not, and uh, really has lifted love, connection, and belonging to the forefront of everything that I do. And I, I've been sharing for years how important it is in in-person instruction to create community, a sense of belonging, and to share our love for our students because we're hardwired as human beings to need love, connection, and belonging. And without that, we experience disconnection. And disconnection is such a challenge psychologically and emotionally, but so many students and, and so many of us have experienced disconnection and it's it's painful and hurtful. This, the sad thing is, is that because of this disconnection that we are now feeling even more in our separation and isolation, it's even more important that we find ways to show our love, care, and compassion for our students. This is a photograph from about 10 years ago of me with my high school marching band students after a performance and we would always circle up and celebrate the performance. And you can see the laughter on the, on the students' faces and such joy right there. And I miss that, right? Uh, for many of us, it's, it's been weeks now that we've been in person with our students. But as I gather with my students and online teaching, I realize, yes, we're separate, but we're together. Like we can feel this common draw to, to, to be with each other, to be heart to heart. And uh, I also want to second what Scott said, that we are all experiencing trauma. We're experiencing trauma in our own way. And um, just acknowledging that is so important. So finding ways to show care and compassion. A couple of days ago, I went on Facebook and a whole bunch of different groups and I asked the question, I said, what are you doing to be able to continue to show care and compassion for your students? I acknowledge that this, this is something that music teachers have done so well in person. That's one of the things we thrive on is, is being that, that person for our students before school, at lunch, after school, in the hallways, Students always coming to us. Many of them get to be with us for four or six years in a row. We can become uh, somewhat of a, a support system. Many of our students have considered like the band family, the orchestra family, the, the choir family, and, and that's something they've been able to count on. Now we've been splintered and separated. So what are ways, and I've been so moved by the outpouring from music educators around the world sharing their ideas of how 
they're showing love and support. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to be sharing some of those beautiful ideas from educators just like you of how we can continue to show love and support for our students. Empathy is something that we've learned through the experience of music. Uh, just being in an ensemble has taught us skills of empathy about how we need to support one another. Intonation is something that's taught us about getting your sound inside of somebody else, working together to create an in-tune chord, knowing how to support the melody when you have the harmony or when you are the melody to, to shine through. It's about understanding somebody else's feelings as if they were your own. It's about walking in their shoes. And now today, I believe that every one of us is experiencing the situation differently. And we can't assume how somebody's feeling, but take the time to listen deeply. And maybe listen before we speak. I think of seeking first to understand then to be understood uh, couldn't be more important today than ever before. It comes down to how do we communicate with our students? And you'll see I have two photos here. And I want to make an acknowledgement that one of the challenges we're facing as a country is that many of our students do not have equal access to technology and Wi-Fi. And so I want to acknowledge that, that as we talk about online teaching, that is leaving out a, a great percentage of students from the conversation. And this has been a great concern of mine is how do we show care and compassion when many students have access to the online uh, groups like, like Google Meet and, and Zoom, but not everybody does. So what can we do? And I wanna share some beautiful things from educators of what they are doing in our country. Many are writing handwritten letters and postcards and putting them in the mail for their students and how meaningful that they're taking the time to do that. And I can only imagine what a difference that makes in a student and their parents' lives when they receive a handwritten note. Other teachers are, are literally calling every single student and family and just checking in. Those that have access to uh, computers and Wi-Fi are, are using a broad range of ways to communicate with their students. But regardless of what platform you're using, the important thing is to lead with care and compassion. Even the language that we speak with our students matters. We can continue to use I, you, I, me language, or we can make the shift right away to just acknowledge that we are in this together. Using words like we, let's, us, together, signifies that we are equals in this uh, exchange of, of compassion and love. Yes, we are the ones that, that have more knowledge in terms of music and have the training to be teachers. But right now, this is a human experience that draws us together. I'm super excited to, to share some of the, the ways that uh, teachers are connecting with their students. And it certainly requires the teacher to be more vulnerable. Teachers are at home in their pajamas talking to their students. They're showing their, their bedroom or their living room. Their children are walking you know, across while they're teaching. Some teachers have turned this into a really fun experience and have had theme days where the teacher will wear a funny costume just to entertain the students. Sometimes they'll have a, a week of themes, like a Hawaiian theme. So every check-in, the students get dressed up and it just is starting to really humanize. What I mean is by connect through vulnerability is that when we are really authentic and real and share that life isn't perfect for us, we don't have to be the knight on the steed, the, the armored knight who's just perfect all the time. It turns out when we can let our defenses down and just show our humanity and lead from our heart that we actually connect more human to human. And this is actually how we build trust. So I would encourage everybody to embrace the vulnerability, embrace your humanness, let your hair down. Those of you that know me know that in person, I would always show up with a, with a coat and tie. And, and, and so now it's just much more relaxed. Um, pets are just one thing that brings people together, showing your pets on, on Google Meets or, or Zoom or what have you. Teachers are introducing the concept of breathing for their students, like slow, mindful breathing, teaching skills to, to slow everything down. One teacher said that she's teaching them uh, yoga stretches to help mu musicians. Teachers are giving 
their students lots of feedback. If they get an email, they're responding to the student right away. Any any work the students sending in, student or teachers are responding positively and just letting the students know they care. They're having meals with their students. I'm hearing about band breakfast where just everybody gets on the computer and they eat together or waffle Wednesdays. People uh, are, of course, grieving the fact that they won't see their students that are, are graduating this year, but they're still taking the opportunity to celebrate their seniors and, and making uh, video presentations and just singing the, the praises of, of the seniors that we'll all miss seeing in person. Schools leadership teams are still getting together and they're working on how can they still serve the other students? How can they reach out to the other students to make sure that they're doing okay? I've seen videos of student leaders talking to the band. They would get a, a Zoom video and three or four student leaders would talk from their bedroom one at a time. And then that video would be sent out to the, the rest of the band just to keep everybody encouraged. Teachers are making videos of themselves to share with students. This is particularly important in school districts and, and, and areas where the school districts are not allowing people to use Zoom. Uh, be, they're not allowing that teacher student video interaction. So what teachers are doing is they're creating videos of themselves saying, Hey guys, uh, really miss you. Gosh, I can't wait till we can get back together again. Here's some things I want to recommend that you do while we're away. Many schools of course are, are not uh, grading right now. And so the grade has become not the thing anymore. And it's, it's really about how are you doing? How are you feeling? That's the centerpiece. People are, are reminiscing about the great memories that they had when they played together, sharing recordings, talking about their favorite pieces. Teachers are using music as a springboard to talk about emotions. They're also giving students choice and saying, hey, go ahead and share with me your favorite piece that moves you, the favorite piece that makes you dance. And let's go ahead and make a class playlist of music. One band director in, in Wisconsin has has uh, motivated his students to create a video to thank healthcare workers. That just moves me so much that that students can think about how can they give back, how can they serve others during this challenging time. It reminds us that we're part of something bigger and greater than ourselves, which is what I've always thought of, about the power of playing in an ensemble. To think that we could use this moment as an opportunity to learn about serving others even in a crisis like today, it just really moves me. I'd also like to acknowledge that care and compassion for all means care and compassion for the students, the student to student, the, the student and teacher's relationship. But I also wanna bring parents into the conversation and acknowledge that now we have an opportunity to build a even greater communication with the parents. Like the parents now become a greater part of the team since they are at home helping their students learn through this process. These are just a few of the things I've gathered in the last two days. And I wanna thank all the music teachers that, that offered ideas. And I, I'd love to continue um, to uh, collect these and, and continue to share them out with others. So I, I wanna close with what I think is really, really important. And it is that I think we all need to show each other grace. We need to acknowledge that we're not perfect. And our students are experiencing trauma. W w many of our students have incredibly difficult situations. Uh, they have parents on the front line, healthcare workers, uh, essential um, jobs, and they might have to be uh, babysitting younger siblings. Um, many of them uh, just with loss of jobs are, are suffering and, and, and may not even have enough food to eat. The struggles that our students um, are facing are real. And so this is why care and compassion becomes even more important. But as Scott said, I hope that we learn from this time in separation about what truly matters as human beings. So when we return, we won't forget the lessons of the importance of care and compassion for all. Thank you for uh, your time. And I'm going to turn this over to Alisa. All right. So I'm sure you could see it coming that we need to talk about care and compassion for yourselves. And I want to echo what Scott and Matthew have already said, especially being kind to each other. We're seeing how everybody 
has kind of this new anxiety level. And we tend to not be as patient with each other as we can be. And certainly we aren't treating each other as well as we treat our students. So as you work in these collaborative environments with teachers within your school, within your district, within the country, within the world, to just have a lot of patience with each other. We're all at different levels. I've been teaching in the online space for you know five or six years now, and I will never be offended if somebody asks me for help because you're probably coming in from a completely different place as well. So let's talk about self-compassion because it, a lot of people are being hard on themselves right now, and you don't have to be. In fact, being able to love ourselves and accept who we are and the journey that we're on can be incredibly powerful for our mindset. So number one, we all make mistakes. And I know as music teachers, we tend to be perfectionists. We are high performing individuals. We are used to having an audience and things going really well. And now we're having to adjust to this new space, these new processes, and these, these new opportunities, and we mess up. You know, the other day I was incredibly frustrated because I was trying to create a process and I kept running into walls and barriers. This program would do these things that I wanted and this program would do these things, but there wasn't something that would do them all. And I kept, I, I felt like I was failing over and over again. But it's in those moments that we can recognize how much stronger the failures can make us. So this is a, a, an analogy that I absolutely love. And this is uh, kintsukurai, which is to repair with gold. So when a, a, a precious piece of pottery has broken, instead of throwing it away, they actually repair it using gold, which makes it even more beautiful. So number one, forgive yourselves for any mistakes that you're making because this is a learning process. And if anything, the mistakes just help us to grow more strong and more beautiful as, as the people that we are. Along those same kinds of lines, we don't have to be perfect. We can be authentic. And truly, that makes that makes people connect with us on an even better level. I'm going to give you a great example. I do these webinars a lot, especially right now. And last week, I was going to be giving a webinar presentation and training to several incredibly talented professional speakers who are going to be presenting at my conference. Matthew Rao was one of them. And it was kind of a rough day for me. It was the anniversary of my dad um, passing away a year ago. So to get myself in a good emotional state, I decided to go for a mountain bike ride. I'm a big mountain biker. You see my bike stuff behind me. And I just went really hard and I ended up crashing. And I was fine. I got the wind knocked out of me a little bit. It took me a minute to kind of get back. I rode more slowly getting home. But it made me late for this this uh, incredibly important training session that I was doing. I ran in, I was five minutes late. I was still in my bike clothes, I was sweaty. I was ripping my helmet off so I had helmet hair. And amazingly enough, that was the authentic me. And that is what those presenters got. And I didn't hear one word of complaint. And it, it actually humanizes you to accept that you make mistakes and that you can be authentic and you don't have to be perfect. So. Just own that fact about yourself. And this is a really important case that I'm trying to make for self-care because I keep getting asked to present on self-care and I, I love it because it is so important. And I could give you a list of actions you can take to show more care for yourself. But the big paradigm shift, I would love for everyone in this world, especially music teachers to make at this time, is that self-care is never ending. It's not a one-time event. It's a mindset that you have that every day you are taking care of yourself every day in every way possible that you are you're nurturing your own needs so that you can give back to others. If you're burning the candle at both ends, if you're overworking yourself and you know it, and you're not balancing that with a little self-care, then you're going to have a very rude mental awakening soon. I know because I've been there and I've done that. 
I've pushed myself too hard without doing the self-care piece. And it can make a huge difference in your outlook. And not only that, but your productivity. You'll actually do a better job, a more meaningful job, a more powerful job if you're taking care of yourself because you'll have more to give to others if you do. So don't be shy about needing time for yourself. And uh, I want to leave you with these few kind of powerful affirmations that you can tell yourself, but I'm going to read them to you because I truly believe this about every one of you, that you can do all that is required of you and even more than that. You have the capacity to learn and grow and adapt in this moment. You already have everything that you need to be successful. You are loved. You are safe. You are a light to this world. You are well. You have hope for the future. You have faith in yourself and you have this life. So own it, embrace it, share who you are with the world, have compassion for yourselves and for each other and for your wonderful students and know that we're gonna get through all of this together. We're here for you, you're here for you. Please reach out if you need help because we're all, we're all in this together. So that's my spiel for you. Any final words or do we wanna go over questions? I'm happy to go to questions. Same. Okay. So this one from Jeremy, uh, do you have an example of your whiteboard in Zoom? Did they type it or write it? Yeah, so uh, they, they typed it and I'm happy to, to email that out uh, to, to anybody that wants to get my email up here. I'm happy to share, um, but it's a it's a beautiful thing when the, the students uh, can type on the whiteboard simultaneously. So you'll see words springing up uh, all over the board and it, it just really lifts people's spirits. There's always a lot of humor. I should say that humor and jokes and stuff are great. A lot of band directors are saying like how they go through a series of, of bad dad jokes and, and how that lifts students' spirits. So uh, the power of just humor and fun, uh, that's totally part of this. We don't need to be super serious and intense. In fact, I would say, don't be, <laughs> relax, relax. Our students need a calm presence. Matthew, I gotta say, I got a little offended when you said, let your hair down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure that's a trigger. I, I, I should have given a warning. I know where you're coming from. Matthew doesn't, but I was bald last June. So and all summer long I was bald, so. I feel you, Scott. I'm there with you, bro. <laughs> I'll remember that. Next time. <laughs> awesome. So then would you just both review some of the ideas that you've heard about how to connect with students who aren't online or can't get online because they don't have access? Sure. And I, I was alluding to or mentioning many of those. Um, and actually, uh, remember Dr. Tim Lotzenheiser a few weeks ago, in one of the first webinars, uh, some, somebody asked, like, how do you reach out? And he said, well, the mail system still works. And, it's, and it was like, oh, right. I mean, you have to make sure you have enough stamps. And, and so I understand that's a, that's the challenge. And of course, people have talked about the amount of time it takes to write a personal note, but I cannot imagine the difference it makes for a student who is secluded, doesn't have the access to technology to receive something in the mail, how meaningful. Um, there's a, a band director, a middle school band director in Tennessee who's, who's calling all of her, every student, and uh, she works with the program United Sound as well. And she's making sure that her students are calling um, all of her new musicians and making sure that they're doing okay. There's a lot of just checking in. That's really the question. How are you? Are you safe? Is there anything I can do or the band can do for you? Please let me know. It's just really opening that door and letting them know that you're here for them. Um, you can still share things for the students to do, even though you can't reach them by the computer. Um, if they have access to email, you can certainly be sending things out. You can send out videos of yourselves. Uh, I know there's many districts across the country that are not allowed to use Zoom, and they're being super creative with that. I'd be happy to, to share an email from, from a school that they, they've shared it with me, and they have incredible 
amount of projects that they've given their students. But again, it's leading with care and compassion. And it's not about the grading and saying, hey, choose from these five things, choose two of them. And, uh, you know, you choose what makes you feel good, what makes you happy and go with yeah. that. Maybe I am significantly older than you two because I can no, remember <laughs> the days before the internet when I was in high school band and junior high band and we had we had books, we had CDs to play along with, we had mm -hmm. phones to call each other. So you may have to rewind the clock some <clears throat> years, but uh, it, it can happen. Amazingly enough, I turned out to be a professional musician and teacher even though I didn't have the internet growing up. And you know what, B beyond any of this one-on-one -on -one instruction, I think oftentimes we underestimate the impact that we're having. You know, I did a couple of read alouds uh, of children's books and put them on YouTube and put them out there. And who knows what the impact uh, of those is going to be. One of the books that I absolutely love is called Mole Music. And it's about this musician mole who plays underground. And at the end of his playing days, he's convinced that no one has ever heard him play. Well, above ground, there are so many different stories that happen with kings and queens and wars being solved over the sounds of his music. So, you know, put something out there and hope it reaches. And it might reach some of your kids, but it might reach so many of our other kids. And it's just gonna be out there and it's gonna have more of an impact than you want. So what I would say is put yourself out there in a vulnerable way, put yourself out there in a way that you think is gonna help your kids put it in a place that you think they're gonna find it, and then we're only doing our best. You know, There's no way that we can guarantee that we're gonna connect with all of our kids. We're trying to cast the net as wide as we can, and then as Lisa said so well, give yourself permission to only do your best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and don't let, don't let failure stick to you, right? Or don't let other op people's opinions stick to you. You, you get to decide which, which people's opinions stick and become part of who you are. If you don't feel like something somebody says or does to you actually jives with who you are, can I say jives? I am old, you guys. Then, you know, let let that go. I think the feedback is really, really key. A, a band director in Oshkosh, Wisconsin shared with me that he's using Flipgrid mm -hmm. and he's having students do that they're playing assignments on Flipgrid, but he's being sure to give feedback and you can give video feedback. And so he's he's literally able to talk back to his students in this exchange of Flipgrid. And I just love that idea of sending positive messages while you're talking to the students. It's not all about the music. You can also pause and say like, hey man, I really hope you're doing well. We're really thinking about you. I miss you in your comments. And, and it's as Scott was saying, it's not just what you do, it's how we do it. Awesome. Well, thank you, you guys. I think that covers all the questions. Um, Tamara did ask about the whiteboard thing, and um, I dropped the link for Explain Everything, which is a non-Zoom collaborative whiteboard sort of thing. Uh, but in case you haven't already gotten into, like if you're looking for more help, there's uh, the, the Facebook group, Music Educators Creating Online Learning. I'm one of the admins of that group. So you're welcome to come in, ask any questions. Um, we're training everybody to be extra nice. And the group is pretty good at self-policing. So it's a, it's a pretty safe space to come and just ask questions and find what it is you're looking for. So any final thoughts from you two? Rely on each other. We can't rely on ourselves. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And please reach out if there's anything we can do for you.